All right, so we are going to go ahead and go through this slideshow. Um, my version is slightly different from yours, but that's okay. It's largely the same. Um, keep in mind that this is a review, okay? So this is just a review of content that you have had before. There should not be anything new that you have not heard before. There should not be anything you haven't seen before. This is just a review and prepping you for the HESI. Um, Keep in mind, HESI absolutely loves to test on patient safety and patient education. Okay, so safety and education are going to be huge components of this. Um, when you are thinking about this with your pharmacology review, a couple of strategies that you can do is to uh, highlight the things that you have forgotten. Um, there is a 15 page review on Blackboard. If you can't find it, let me know. Um, again, identify the things that you've forgotten. There, um, is the outline that includes the four pages of the drug classes. Um, think about which exams you scored the worst on and which systems those were, and then start with those systems when you're reviewing them. With the chapters in the textbook, study the key points and do the eight questions in the back. They're an excellent review for you. Ignore this bit about Canvas, but you absolutely have your Evolve um, HESI that you can and should be doing until you can get the highest possible score, right? So be doing all of those things. When you're thinking about answering farm questions, how do you know a medication has been effective? It's because it has a therapeutic effect. So if you think about the therapeutic effect, has the drug actually achieved what it's supposed to do? Have you actually accomplished what you set out to do? Um, we are concerned about any potential side effects and adverse effects. Side effects are not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Neither are adverse effects. Ad side effects are just an aspect of adverse effects or a type of adverse effect, right? Um, think about the things that are going to be dangerous to the patient that are going to make the patient unsafe. If the call, if the answer is uh, call the provider, is there a pertinent uh, assessment answer. So it doesn't actually match, right? Is there an assess assessment answer that would indicate a need to call a provider? That can be an indicator that that could potentially be a correct answer. All right, I'm going to briefly look at those pharmacokinetics. These are the effects of the body on the drug. Pharmacodynamics are the effects of the drug on the body. Um, know all of the uh, abbreviations at the bottom, ACHS, so AS, that type of thing. Uh, labs. Okay, so with PT, remember that uh, PT versus APTT are separate. PT and INR always go together. PT and INR are with warfarin. APTT is going to be with heparin. Uh, that is normally 25 to 35, but we want it to be 60 to 90 if they are on heparin treatment. Uh, your PT INR, so your INR is normally 0 0.9 to 1.1. We want it to be 2, point, uh, 2 to 3 if they are on tre treatment with warfarin. Um, when you're thinking about warfarin, uh, sorry, liver panels, think about the fact that the liver panel will be elevated if there is damage to the liver. So if we have a significant amount of acetaminophen on board, they're going to have elevated liver, liver panels. Uh, whenever there's liver toxicity present, you're going to have see that elevated liver level, okay? Um, when you are thinking about uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit, for hemoglobin, think 12 to 16. For hematocrit, think 35 to 45. Just a good generalized lab value to know. For your platelets, you want to think that they're going to be uh, greater than 150,000. It's going to be a concern. White blood cells, we're looking at 4,000 to 11,000. Red blood cells, really, we're looking at three to four. Um, <laughs> what else do I want to point out here? With potassium, 3.5 to 5 is going to be your normal level. Uh, think about what drugs are going to affect the potassium level. If they affect the potassium level, you're going to want to know and know in which direction. Does it make it higher? Does it make it low? Uh, for your, um, let's see here, sodium, this is going to be our fluid balance levels, right? We have salt shifts, sodium shifts, and water shifts as well. Uh, think about you know, what type of fluid we might want to give based off of what that is. Oh, sorry. Mm. With lithium level, anything greater than 1.2 is toxic. Any other drugs that have a toxic level, you want to know the toxic level, right? So if it says toxic level for lithium is greater than 1.2, you want to know those things, okay? 
All right, IBN, IB fluids, TPN, uh, hypertonic saline, that's our 3% saline. Massive, massive risk for fluid overload. Think about crackles in the lungs and elevated blood pressure. Um, we would use the hypertonic saline whenever a patient is severely, severely hypotonic. So not for mild hyponatremia. Mild hyponatremia, we're going to correct with PO uh, salt replacements. Um, severe hyponatremia, we can correct with hypertonic saline. We can also use this for increased ICP. Um, remember that fluid moves from the interest, interstitial fluid into the veins, right? That's what it's doing. So we're pulling fluid into the veins. This is a high alert med. It can be fatal um, if the sodium level is not critically low or if we're correcting it too quickly. Um, lactated ringers, these are isotonic. Do not give them if the patient has liver disease. For TPN, we want to know that TPN versus lipids are yellow versus white, right? It looks a little bit different. You cannot give anything else with TPN except for lipids. That's the only thing you can give with it. Uh, massive risk for hyperglycemia. It's going to drive their blood glucose up, so make sure you're monitoring for signs of hyperglycemia. Polydipsia, polyuria, polyphagia. Um, they can get some headaches, some dehydration, some nausea, vomiting, weakness. Um, we want to monitor that and monitor for liver damage as well. We're doing labs daily with these patients, ideally. Uh, for hypoglycemia, they're going to have cold, clingy skin. They may have some dizziness and tachycardia, some paresthesia. If you ever stop TPN, you need to monitor for hypoglycemia. So it's going to go the opposite direction. Um, there's a pretty significant rebound effect there for the hypoglycemia. It happens quickly. We also want to make sure that we know signs of extravasation and phlebitis and then what to do. If you have extravasation and phlebitis, you're going to see some uh, redness, swelling, pain, heat, maybe some streaking. You need to stop the infusion and notify the provider and then monitor any swelling that is present. For our pregnancy categories, uh, for this we are looking at our A is going to be, uh, this is okay, this is typically our levothyroxine and folic acid. Um, when we're thinking about B, this is probably okay, but we don't really have enough information. This is metformin, oxybutynin, and ox amoxicillin, acetaminophen are both on here. Um, for C, this is either we don't have studies that show whether or not there is a risk or there is some risk in animal studies. Um, NSAIDs are a huge one on this list as well as albuterol, uh, gabapentin, and lodipine are all on there. For D, this is going to be a risky category. So risks need to outweigh the benefits. Think tetracycline ACE inhibitors on here, low sartan, diazepam. Diazepam was a really good example of a drug that we would give if uh, we absolutely had to, right? If our patient's actively seizing, we're going to give diazepam and then discontinue it after we control the seizure. For X, this is going to be absolute contraindication. This is our sartans, warfarin, chemo drugs, ARBs are on here. Anything that's going to cause known uh, tetragenic effects. All right, elderly, start low and go slow. Always, always think fall risk management. They are going to keep their drugs in their system longer because they have decreased liver function, decreased GFR, less body mass. They are therefore more likely to become toxic with medications. Um, they also frequently will have polypharmacy, so we need to do lots of medication reconciliation, lots of teaching with elderly population, making sure that we know exactly what they're on. Um, these are your common medication suffixes and what they attach to and more. Antihypertensives, um, with these, we're thinking about all of these medications. We've gone over all this, right? You know all these. Uh, for our ACE, excuse me, ACE inhibitors, um, these are our pearls. These are uh, vasodilators and diuretics as well. They kind of do a little bit of both. They are absolutely useful for post-MI. Um, with this, they're going to decrease the stroke volume resistance, therefore decreasing the afterload. Um, because of that, we can also use them for CHF. Uh, also because they cause diuresis and decrease the preloads. We like those. Do keep in mind that ACEs, when combined with NSAIDs, can potentiate some renal failure. So we can get some exacerbations there. Uh, these also cause a very irritating dry cough. Think about patient teaching as to how you could manage the dry cough. Um, they also have a high uh, potassium level and are not as effective for black patients. 
For our ARBs, these are Sartans. We can use these if they don't tolerate the ACE, usually because of that dry cough. Don't combine them with the ACE because they have a very, very similar side effect profile. Um, they don't cause a cough. They do cause fetal toxicity. Uh, this is also true if the mother is breastfeeding. So we do not want to use it if they are breastfeeding or pregnant. Um, we do want to monitor the potassium while they're on this. Um, and uh, for, let's see, our beta blockers, these are our LOLs. They are also useful for post-MI. Some for CHF, not quite as effective. Absolutely do not use them if they have a history of asthma, cough, or wheezing. That is a contraindication. Um, let's see, it does lower the heart rate. We want to make sure you take the heart rate before you administer. If it's less than 60, we don't want to give it. Teach the patient how to uh, take their own heart rate, and they can also mask the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. Our CCBs, these are our p uh, pines uh, and our verapamil and deltazem. Um, they are going to lower the heart rate a little bit. Use them cautiously with CHF. It can cause some peripheral edema. Uh, they are helpful for treating hypertension and angina. Um, they are also a smooth muscle relaxer, relaxer, so we can use them for pregnancy contractions as well. Don't combine them with beta blockers. Uh, never, ever stop any blood pressure med abruptly. They are going to have rebound effects. If you stop an ACE inhibitor abruptly, you can have angioedema. Um, all of these can cause orthostatic hypotension. They need to change their position slowly. Usually if they're not working, it's because the patient isn't taking them. Um, let's see. Alpha-1 blockers, these are our SINs, more often used for, um, sorry, these are used for BPH, so benign prostatic hypertrophy. Think about how you know that's effective. If they are having more effective urine output and uh, less urinary frequency and less nocturia, we know the therapeutic effect has been achieved and they have, um, it's been effective for them. Alpha-2 agonists is going to be our clonidine. Remember, it's frequently a patch form, lots of side effects. Orthostatic blood pressure is huge for these. They get fatigue, dizziness. Um, these are usually used after other drugs have failed or in conjunction with another med. Uh, also, make sure they remove the old patch before putting on a new one. They need to rotate sites. An extremely severe um, rebound hypertension when discontinued abruptly. Di Diuretics are often a first-line treatment for hypertension. Hydrochlorothiazide, we like it because it's going to lower that sodium. Um, it is also going to lower the potassium, so keep an eye on that. There's some cross-sensitivity with sulfa meds. If they have a sulfa allergy, don't give it. Uh, Furosemide, that is our classic loop diuretic. That's our Lasix. This is our preferred medication for severe um, edema, emergency needs. We typically use furosemide. Uh, be very cautious in severe liver disease. Spironolactone um, is going to lower the the sodium levels, it is potassium sparing. Uh, so you can get some potassium toxicity if you're not careful. It can also cause some gynecomastia. Let's see. All right, digoxin. Toxicity is going to be greater than two nanograms per milliliter. This is going to help lower the heart rate. It is going to also increase the cardiac output. That's why we like it. Uh, we absolutely need to monitor the blood levels regularly. This is usually used uh, for CHF. We do need to monitor the potassium levels for sure, especially if they're on a Lasix. A lot of times we put patients on both Lasix and DIG because of CHF. We need to very carefully monitor the potassium if we're doing that. Um, some side effects, you can have some halos, uh, green, yellow vision, and vision changes with toxicity. That's The first sign of toxicity is usually GI, so usually nausea, vomiting, and abdominal cramps. Um, and then you get the halos in the green color, the vision changes. Um, Digibind is going to be our, our reversal. Uh, we are going to use that if we have dig toxicity. We also want to note that bran is going to affect the absorption as well. Um, we do not want our patient to be eating any licorice because licorice can be potassium wasting as well. Uh, also be careful with that. Um, mm, never mind. Okay, dibutamine. Uh, this is an inotropic and chromotropic drug. Um, so this is only going to be given whenever we need to make the heart beat 
harder and faster. Uh, so think bradycardia, severe bradycardia, we're going to use some dubunamine. Um, this is only given IV in microgram per kilogram per minute. We do need intensive monitoring, so we definitely want this patient on a cardiac monitor and uh, get regular blood pressures, you know, have those cycling while we have them on it. We are monitoring these patients very carefully. Dopamine is going to be a press presser. Its goal is to increase the blood pressure. It is also inotropic and chromotropic. Um, it does cause severe extravasation. We are going to give phentolamine uh, locally as our antidote. For nitroglycerin, that is going to be a medication that's very effective for uh, decreasing angina. Uh, we need to teach our patient how to actually give it. It is a patent vas vasodilator. Um, we know it's effective if we have relief of pain, right? So after you've taken the first dose, if you still have chest pain, call 911 and then take the second dose. They can take up to three doses of this. Um, let's see the dose, um, do, 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 do. is going to, the medication is going to help, uh, the heart pump, uh, harder and faster. So it makes the heart more effective and delivers better oxygen to the heart. With our antiarrhythmics, um, with this, uh, I believe on your side, you have, um, Atropine. So if we're thinking atropine, we're thinking uh, we want to treat bradycardia and is systole. It is a cholinergic blocker um, and it works on the heart and the smooth muscles of the bronchi and GI tract as well. It's going to help increase the heart rate. For adenosine, this is going to be a, a half-life of one half second. So it's very, very quick. It's going to be used for SVT to revert that rhythm. It is going to cause a period of asystole uh, and then it's going to restart. So it's going to re-kick that electrical um, conduction, hopefully in a normal pattern. Uh, with sodalol, this is a beta blocker. Um, it is going to increase the QT interval. It's frequently used for AFib and flutter. Mm, amiodarone is going to be uh, fast abnorm abnormal cardiac rhythms, um, fast atrial rhythms, fib flutters, uh, also ventricular rhythms such as VTAC and VFib. Um, it is usually dosed as 150 milligram bolus, then a 24 hour drip. Uh, the dosages are a bit different um, for 300 milligram bolus if they're in VTAC and CPR. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, with our antiarrhythmics as well, we're thinking about Von, Will William Von Williams classification. Um, we have our class one that's going to be our lidocaine, class two is beta blockers. Um, move on. All right, anticoagulants. Um, with our anticoagulants, we want to make sure with our uh, warfarin, this is a vitamin K antagonist. Um, warfarin and antibiotics, the antibiotics are going to be in have increased absorption because of the warfarin. Um, because the warfarin, the antibiotics are killing off the GI tract. So we have increased absorption of the warfarin whenever the patient is on antibiotics because it's killing, killing off all that healthy gut bacteria. Um, vitamin K is going to be your antidote for warfarin as well. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. We want our INR to be two to three. If it's going up above three, that's when we would want to use our vitamin K. Uh, be cautious with green leafy vegetables. They need to be eating them either consistently or not at all. Um, with heparin, uh, remember our um, PTT is going to guide our therapy, right? So um, we want to make sure that we're monitoring that. Uh, the antidote is going to be protamine sulfate. Make sure you're not using aspirin, ginkgo, ginseng, garlic, ginger concurrently with any of these because they will potentiate the bleeding and make it worse. With our antiplatelets, um, think aspirin. This is, uh, we want to take it with at least six to 80 ounces of water to decrease the GI distress. It can take it with a small amount of food as well. Um, with our clopidogrel, that's our Plavix, our antiplatelet med. Um, we usually use these together. They are frequently together, uh, especially if we have, uh, the history of sense and bypasses and we need antiplatelets on there on board with our thrombolytic. This is our altaplase or activase, uh, it's a tissue plasma activator. It is going to bust open that clot. It does have a half-life of about five minutes. Um, 
Antihypolipidemics, uh, these are to lower cholesterol. Uh, all of these can cause a little bit of GI upset. We usually give them in combination. Statins are preferred. They are the most effective at lowering the LDL, usually given in the evening. Um, they do still need to actually do diets. Um, let's see. These can cause some um, rhabdomyolysis. So we want to be careful if the patient is reporting any muscle aches or pains, we need to notify the physician. With all of these antihyperlipidemics, we want to monitor the liver and the renal functioning. Um, let's see. Bile acids, sequestrants, these are our coals. Uh, these are going to prevent GI absorption of a lot of other drugs. Um, can also be used for diabetes treatments. Um, they're often used in combination with statins. Niacin is going to cause some facial flushing. We want to give small doses of aspirin about 30 minutes before that niacin uh, to calm that down. Also mix it with four to six ounces of fluid. Um, all of these meds, uh, but especially the the nice the sorry bile acid sequestrants um, need to be at least one hour before other meds or four to six hours after others. So it really needs to be spaced out and not near any other other medications because it's going to affect the absorption of those. This is a slide, so I want you to go ahead and pause this recording while you review this slide. It is going to be something that allows you to kind of mix and match. Your uh, selections can be helpful for a lot of people. And then I will show you the answers on the next slide. Hang on. All right, we're gonna move on. So this is gonna be the answers to that matching. Go ahead and take a look at that um, so that you can review the correct answers. All right, respiratory drugs. So our Sabas and Labas, uh, these are Terols, our Butyrol versus Symmetrol. Um, these are gonna be our Saba is our rescue inhaler versus Laba are the long acting. Uh, we usually use the long acting in conjunction with a steroid. Um, those are your ICSs, your ozones, and your solides. Um, these do have lots of side effects with thrush, especially we want them to use spacer and rinse their mouth really well after use. With the sabas and labas, they get lots of high heart rates, uh, can also get some tremors and a little bit of anxiety with those meds. Um, the uh, steroids are going to be used to treat acute exacerbations. They help to decrease the bronchospasms. They calm down the bronchoconstriction and the mucus in the COPD patients as well. Uh, sorry, the bronchoconstriction and mucus in COPD is going to be our anticholinergics. So the reason we would use anticholinergics is to treat COPD. This is our epitropium. Um, they help to calm down the bronchoconstriction and the mucus in the COPD patients. With our methylxanthines, this is our theophylline uh, and aminophylline. Um, these are IV bronchodilators. Uh, we give them IV to status asthmaticus, especially if they're not responding to epi. Um, significant side effects, they have quite a few of them. Um, we can occasionally give them PO to prevent asthmatic and COPD symptoms. They are not going to be um, for acute symptoms. They're going to be to prevent asthma asthmatics or for if it's IV, it's to the status asthmaticus. Uh, we can also use leukotriene modifiers or monolukat. Monolucus. This is a prophylactic drug. This is not used for acute attacks. It is oral and it's taken as a controller med. Um, let's see. And at the bottom, that's just going over to how to use a spacer. All right, antidepressants, these are TCAs, our triptylenes. Uh, TCAs are very, very dangerous if they overdose with alcohol, uh, extremely lethal. We also want to keep in mind that they have some CNS and cardiac effects as well. Um, they do have a seizure risk that goes along with them. All of these medications are going to have risk of serotonin syndrome. S side effects are the symptoms are listed at the top, as well as suicidal ideations, especially if stopped abruptly. Uh, most of them take several weeks to become effective. Never, ever stop them abruptly. They have to be tapered off. 
with our SSRIs, uh, this is going to be one of the main ones that causes serotonin syndrome. Uh, lots of side effects, especially antiplatelet effects as well. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. With our amitriptyline, also know that it can be used for insomnia as well as neuropathic pain. Uh, it is um, going to also potentially have some uh, anticholinergic effects and uh, it can discolor the urine. With our SNRIs, these can cause some hypertension, high heart rates. Our MAIOIs, we don't like anymore because they interact with all the things, especially foods high in triuramine. So those are dried cheeses, aged wines, basically anything that tastes yummy is going to have some toxicity. Uh, with our MAOIs, uh, we can also potentiate some hypertensive crisis as well. Um, bupropion is usually used for insomnia patients. For bipolar disorder, we can have some mood stabilizers, so we might want to use some lithium. Uh, it, this has significant side effects. It's worse if they're, if they're dehydrated. Uh, for toxicity, they can have some sword speech and muscle spasms, some nystagmus. Mm, let's see. Our antipsychotics, again, psychosis happens usually because of too much dopamine. All of these can cause serotonin syndrome as well. Um, we see a lot of tardive dyskinesia and extra perinomodal symptoms with these as well. Um, our typicals are going to help with those positive symptoms, so the, ha the excessiveness. Haloperidol is a really common one that we could use for this. It's going to kind of slow everything down. Our atypical antipsychotics, these help with the positive symptoms and potentially some negative symptoms, so those depressive symptoms, um, can have some weight gain. Uh, these are apines, so clazapine. Mm -hmm. It can have some agranulocytosis with clozapine. Um, and I, and I saw lytics, uh, this is our GABAergics, our beno, benzodiazepines, our PAMs and LAMs. Uh, I think Xanax, the antidote to these is flumazenil. Side effects is going to be anything sedation, so all CNS depressants. With our sedatives and hypnotics, these are uh, over-the-counters, do not have any dependence associated with them, but they do have some next day sedation, so a little bit of sleepiness. So our diphenhydronumine or our Benadryl, everybody thinks feels just really groggy the next day. Uh, melatonin agonists, fortunately, do not have any dependence because they are agonists, so that's our remelton, useful for insomnia. Our non-benzos are going to all have some dependence level, uh, so people become dependent on these. So this is our, um, our zolpidem, our Ambien, Sonata, um, anticholinergics, and antihistamine dependence antidepressants. They don't have any dependence, but there is still some next day sedation with these. So trazodone is the most common one we think of there. Anti-seizure meds. Uh, with these guys, we're always monitoring drug levels. Uh, very high risk for uh, toxicity with them. Um, never ever stop these abruptly. We have to taper them for phenytoin. Our therapeutic level is going to be 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter. We want excellent oral care, uh, very irritating to the veins. Make sure you're watching for extravasation. Uh, carbazepine, grapefruit juice is going to increase the blood level of the medication. Grapefruit juice causes toxicity of a lot of meds though. So never really want to have that um, with other drugs. Um, let's see. For diazepam, that's going to be our uh, diazepam and lorazepam are going to be short acting, um, followed closely by phenobarbital and phenotone, which are long acting. Um, I'm going to skip over that. This is another matching slide. Uh, you can review this. Go ahead and pause, see if you can do the matching, and the answers will be on the next slide. That's this guy. Our antibiotics, now we're getting into our uh, penicillins. So we have our uh, penicillins are going to be one of our most common drug reactions. Uh, it's the highest number. They can prolong the QT interval and have some potential for renal toxicity as well. Um, this is anything that ends in our psyllin, right? Uh, with our cephalus born, this is our first or fifth generation. As we increase in generation, it is going to increase in the gram-negative activity. So our third generation is where we actually start to have some gram-negative activity as well as gram-positive. And then fourth and fifth are even more effective on the gram-negatives uh, and, and uh, can cross the blood-brain barrier with the third generation. 
Um, there is a 1% cross sensitivity re reaction with penicillin. So if they have a severe penicillin allergy, we do not want to give a cephalosporin. Um, let's see. Uh, vancomycin, be careful for red band syndrome. It is also ototoxic. That is permanent to make sure you know the symptoms for those. Uh, if you notice uh, ototoxicity, we need to stop the med and notify the provider immediately. Um, tetracyclines, avoid sun. There's lots of photosensitivity for these. They also stain the teeth, so do not give them in pregnancy or breastfeeding mothers. Uh, macrolides prolong the QT interval, I think is a thermiacin with that guy. Aminoglycosides are bad in pregnancy as well. They have a significant renal toxicity and ototoxicity. Uh, for aclinolones, uh, avoid the sun. We do not want to do any, uh, sorry, we have a lot of photo, photosensitivity with aclinolones. Also, they cause that tendon rupture to the Achilles tendon, especially. Um, let's see. Sulfanamides, again, photosensitivity, lots of GI upset. Insulins, we want to make sure we drop regular before NPH, so clear before cloudy. Um, know the different types of insulin, especially the onsets and peaks, uh, and then the rules for administering insulin, which I know you've got in skills lab. With our diabetic type 2 drugs, uh, we have our hypoglycemics. Uh, these help to secrete insulin. Uh, our rides and zides uh, can have some weight gain with them. Uh, we do want to avoid, avoid these if there's a sulfa allergy. Glipizide only de has decreased absorption if taken with food. So we want to make sure we're careful with that. Our insulin sensitizers is our metformin. It's going to help uh, the patient be more effective with the use of their insulin. They do have a lot of GI distress with metformin. Our uh, thiazetolones, our TZDs, can cause weight gain and edema. We don't want to use these with our CHF patients, and they take a fair amount of time to work, so we want to be careful with that. Let's see. I'll go through here. Bile acids, the questions can be helpful as well. Those are our colds, like we talked about before. There's another matching slide. Feel free to pause this and then go through it. And then we have our answers. Endocrine meds with levothyroxine, this is our synthroid. Uh, we use this to treat hypothyroidism. The side effect of this is a high heart rate because it's increasing the met metabolic state of the patient. Make sure you take the heart rate before they actually take the med. We do want to hold it if it's over than 100. And this should be taken first thing in the morning. So ideally, they wake up, they set an alarm, wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, take their synthroid, go back to sleep for an hour, and then they can wake up and take their um the rest of their meds and their meals. We do want it to be an hour before meals and food as well. Let's see. Progesterone, this can be in a pill shot form or it can be included in uh, one of the implants. Estrogen, it can be a variety of levels of micrograms of estrogen, can also be combined with progesterone. For our hepatitis drugs, uh, think interferon A. This can cause some flu-like symptoms. Take a little bit of acetaminophen before the injection to pre-treat it. This is subcutaneous only. We want to bypass the gut for this. With lactulose, this is going to be given for high ammonia levels. Uh, we see lots of pooping with these patients. For our GI drugs, we can have some ranididine. Um, this helps to reduce the production of acid. Pentaprozole, uh, inhibits the production of the gastric acid. Odansetron is very effective for preventing nausea vomiting, can have some diarrhea as a side effect. Uh, Sucralophate or caraphate, we want to make sure it is spaced out. So nothing around this med at all. If you see anything on the HESI that says caraphate and anything else, think no. Um, so we want to give it at least an hour after meals or two hours before meals, full glass of water, no antacid within 38 minutes of the med. Um, make sure it's spaced out from all the other things. Let's see. Make sure you don't crush long-acting meds. Uh, sulfanazine can't be given if you have a sulfa allergy. Biphosphonates, these are dronates. These help to strengthen the bones and prevent structures. fractures. We can use these for our osteoporosis patients. It does need to be with full glass of water, and they have to be upright for 30 minutes because of the potential for esophageal necrosis. It actually destroys and eats the esophagus, so they absolutely have to be upright for 30 minutes if they're going to take this. 
Uh, don't take it with food. It's going to decrease its absorption and effectiveness. Same with calcium and antacids. But calcium and antacids pretty much can't be consumed with anything else anyways. Corticosteroids are short-term. This is going to be, uh, can cause some hyperglycemia and immunosuppression as well. Long-term, we can end up seeing some osteoporosis and glaucoma. Think moon face as well. We can get that buffalo hump, that uh, moon face appearance with these. That will reverse once we have stopped the corticosteroids. Never, ever stop corticosteroids abruptly. We need to taper them or we can cause um, a significant reaction. Opioids have a significant constipation effect. We know this. They also have CNS effects, so some lightheadedness and urinary retention. Uh, we can take it with food. It's going to help to minimize the GI upset. We want them to keep the pain controlled. The higher it gets, the harder it is to get back under control. Don't take them with alcohol because it's going to have increased uh, CNS depressant effects. A uh, patient has to push the button if we're doing a PCA pump. We have to monitor the respiratory rate. CNS is always a double-check med. Meperidine or Demerol, this is used for post-operative shivering is the main use for that one. Uh, antidotes for all opioids is going to be naloxone. It can be given every two to three minutes per in. It's very, very short half-life, so we have to redose it frequently. Um, make sure you're assessing the respiratory rate frequently. Uh, it's going to reverse all of the pain relief, so they're going to have immediate withdrawal and be very, very angry with you. For our NSAIDs, um, this is going to be our uh, Ketorolac ibuprofen. Uh, don't take them with aspirins. We can have an increased risk of bleeding. They are going to be rough on the kidneys as well. Make sure you're monitoring kidney function. Can cause some heart failure, especially in the elderly. Make sure you're monitoring for the effect on the heart. Acetaminophen is not an NSAID. It is an analgesic, however. We're going to have a maximum of four grams per day. That's going to be three grams in the presence of liver failure um, or heavy alcoholism. Uh, antidote for that is going to be mucomist. Here is another matching slide for you. I'm going to pause this recording for a little bit. All right, we're going to wrap this up. All right, so here are your answers for that last matching slide. And ophthalmic drugs. So ophthalmic drugs think eyes, right? So glaucoma, uh, anything that's going to affect blood pressure can uh, impact your your eyes as well. Um, anything that dries secretions, anticholinergics are going to be effective. Betazolol or tamolol are frequently used for uh, treating glaucoma. Again, these are beta blockers. We want to prevent systemic absorption. In order to do that, we want it to go just into the conjunctal sac and then press onto the lacrimal duct for 30 to 60 seconds to make sure it doesn't have systemic absorption and stays in the eyes. Um, know your terms versus meiosis versus mydriasis. Our chemo drugs, methotrexate is an extremely common one. Uh, for this one, it is going to cause some neutropenia, some thrombocytopenia and anemia. It does have a leucovorin rescue. So the rescue meant for that is gonna be leucovorin. Uh, tamoxifen is a medication that causes some local swelling. It can cause some soft tissue disease. Uh, be careful with that. With our, let's see, uh, philgastrin, this stimulates white blood cell production and can increase the uric acid levels. Uh, Taldafil or sildenafil uh, is a medication that is used for electrol erectile dysfunction. Uh, vasodilators if given in conjunction with those are going to significantly drop the blood pressure. Never give the nitro if a patient has had one of these in the past 24 to 48 hours because they are very, very potent vasodilators, especially when used in conjunction. Uh, our dilsalfram or antabuse is going to be a medication that we give to help people stop drinking because of that is going to cause a very, very severe reaction if you drink alcohol while taking it, which is kind of the point. Pyridostigmine is a medication that is used to treat myosinia gravis. It does have an antidote of atropine. Uh, carbidopa, levodopa, this is a medication used for Parkinson's. That carbidopa is important because it makes more levodopa available for the transport of the brain. It helps it actually cross the blood-brain barrier and have more levodopa available. Uh, iron, we want to take on an amyxomatic or with G orange juice. It can turn stools black and cause significant uh, GI upset as well. 
let's see, cyclosporin can be given to prevent organ depression, organ rejection. So we're going to give this to cause immunosuppression. Never take it with the grape fruit juice. Epinephrine, we give IM for anaphylaxis. Allopurinol helps to decrease your acid. Let's see. Immune system, our rubella vaccine is going to be given sub Q, not IM. Um, let's see. Other vaccines, we have our HPV vaccine is three shots and three with uh, three months between the first and the third dose. Tetanus needs to have a booster every 10 years. Uh, immunosuppressants, these are our MABs, uh, are going to be specific to the antigen on the cancer cell itself. Uh, these are all medications that affect the liver function. There are more than just these. These are drugs that cause urine color changes. There are more. Um, they can also affect the tears and cause the tears to be red orange and affect their contact lenses as well. Huge patient teaching rifampin and pyridine or that fenzopyridine are the really common ones there. Um, let's see, photosensitivity, tetracyclines, doxycycline, amiodarone, our herbals, kava, can have some liver toxicity associated with it. ephedra. is going to be a stimulant. It is going to have increased cardiovascular and stroke risks. Grapefruit juice is going to increase toxicity uh, for many, many drugs, like we've talked about. St. John's warts is going to increase serotonin syndrome if taken with another serotonin medication. This is our uh, nature's Prozac. Valerian root can increase CNS depression. Don't use it with other meds that cause CNS depression. Um, medication administration, know your patient rights. Uh, we need to identify yours. We have to document. That's going to be the sixth right according to the textbook. Uh, always determine if they have swallowing risk factors. We need to make sure that they're actually capable of swallowing. With sublingual, it goes under the tongue. Don't give them anything to drink. We want to make sure it fully dissolves. Peg tube, we need to confirm the placement. Uh, make sure that you're positioned upright, at least for, you know, 30, 45 minutes after administration. Don't crush extended release meds ever. Um, all the meds need to be given separately and diluted. If we're giving it rectally, they need to be in the left lying Sims position. Um, insulin rules. Uh, don't use a milliliter syringe. You have to use a unit syringe for these. It needs to be clear before cloudy. Um Eyes, we already talked about ears with young kids. We're going to pull that pinna down and back if they're less than three. Older than that, we're going to pull the pinna up and back. Uh, keep them on their side for five to ten minutes to help it absorbed. MDIs and DPIs, remember to use that inhaler and uh, sorry spacer and brush your teeth. Dosage calculation, we have beat into the ground. Um, there are matchings in these slides that you can feel free to go through. And that is all I have for you.